Hello, and welcome to Live from New Amsterdam, a series of bite-sized conversations about New Netherland, uh, which is a collaboration of the New Netherland Institute and the New Amsterdam Project at New York Historical Society. I am Deborah Hamer, the director of the New Netherland Institute. Uh, and today my guest will be Melissa Morris, an assistant professor of history at the University of Wyoming. Um, welcome, Melissa. Hi, Deborah. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's it's a pleasure. Um, so everyone, feel free to use the uh, the uh, Q and A function to to ask questions as we're talking. We will get to those questions at the end, towards the end, the last five ten minutes uh, of the discussion. But feel free to use it as as uh, questions come up for you while Melissa and I are talking. Um, so let me just set the stage a little bit for our uh, our listeners. Um, New Netherland uh, was first claimed by the Dutch in 1609 after Henry Hudson's voyage under the auspices of the Dutch East India Company. Uh, there was uh, trading there uh, in the 16 teens, and then the Dutch West India Company was founded in 1621. And the first colonists, formal colonists who were sent to spend uh, their lives in New Netherland arrived in 1623 or 1624. Um, so, Melissa, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about set the larger context for this uh, New Netherland uh, project with some other activities that the Dutch were up to at the time. Sure. Yeah. So by the time those first colonists show up, um, the Dutch already had a few decades of experience in the Americas. And a lot of this activity took place in the Caribbean and along the coast of South America, as I'm sure Many of you out there know some of this did involve piracy, uh, but the Dutch were also involved in other other things too. There's more more peaceful trading, both with their independent indigenous groups living on some of the islands, um, as well as with the Spanish. So they will raid the Spanish, but there are also some Spanish colonists who realize that um, you know the Dutch can offer them things that they want, right? Um, they, they exploit salt mines and other natural resources. So what this meant was that, you know, by the, by the time New Netherland is being colonized, you also have quite a few merchants, sailors, and others who have a lot of experience far to the South. Um, and so one of the things they do is they do establish colonies there as well, um, in the South American coast. So what, um, we're calling the Guianas, with the Dutch at the time would call the wild coast. And they're not alone in, in this, um, the English, the French and others are there as well. And this area is really, um, it's appealing to these Northern Europeans because the Portuguese are down in Brazil and the Spanish are in what's now Venezuela, not very strong there. And so they see this as a, as a region that's uncolonized, um, they they build some alliances with indigenous people there because these indigenous people um have a lot of enmity towards the spanish so it's sort of a you know the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of thing and they also see this as a good place to settle because it it um it has the promise of tropical commodities and that's something that you can't you know new netherland has a lot of advantages of course but something that you know it doesn't have is uh, a hot climate so starting from the early 1600s, there are, are trading companies that send people to this region. Sometimes they might send just, you know, a couple men to establish trade, but there are some bigger endeavors as well. Uh, just to give a few examples, in 1614, there's a group of about 150 that go from, from Flushing, Flissingen in the Netherlands, um, and they're Dutch and English, and, and they set up a colony on the Amazon, so quite far to the south. Um, so a lot of these colonies are are short lived, but over time, though, the Dutch presence in this region, you know, leads to some things you might know about, like the Dutch briefly capturing Brazil, as well as the longer lasting permanent colonies of, of Demerara, Burbies, Dutch Guiana, which gives rise to Suriname. Um, so, yeah, so this is all happening. And then they're also colonizing places in the Caribbean as well. So this is all happening at the same time as New Netherlands. So how does it help us to think about New Netherland if we we kind of think about it in this larger geographical context? Like, does it change the way we think about New Netherland at all? Or well, Of course, I'm going to say yes. Yeah. Uh, I can't say no to that question. <laughs> I, I know, just, it's too much of a softball. 
there's a lot of connections. So there are, you know, merchants, traders, people that, that are involved in both of these places. So they're not really, it's not like they're isolated places. Um, there are some, there are some actual connections and then there's also lots of plans for connections. So I'll just give you one example that was perhaps a bit misguided. Um, when the Dutch capture Brazil, the people, uh, uh, there are some people in New Netherland that are writing about, oh, how can we make connections? And they, they think of Brazil as a potential source of slave labor. So like they know that there are enslaved Africans in Brazil and they think maybe some of them will wind up in New Netherland that Dutch Brazilians aren't, aren't interested in that. Um, and then, you know, one of the other things that I'm really interested in and write a lot about is, is tobacco. So um, tobacco is one of the only plantation crops that's um, indigenous to the Americas. And it's something that Europeans learn how to grow and, and to consume from indigenous people. And so you might think New Netherland and tobacco, that doesn't seem like there would be any connections there, but actually there are there are plans to grow tobacco in New Netherland and, and the tobacco that they attempt to grow there is not, uh, tobacco is indigenous to, um, to New Netherland, to New York, but the type that they try and grow actually comes from the South, from the Caribbean and, and South America and those places. That's so interesting um, that they wouldn't just try to cultivate the variety that is readily available um, to them. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about how the Dutch actually learned to, to cultivate tobacco? Um, something that uh, the audience won't know is that um, Melissa and I uh, uh, met up with each other at Colonial Williamsburg uh, several years ago when Melissa was researching tobacco. And part of that research was actually, I believe, um, just going and watching tobacco grow <laughs> in the flesh right there in front of you. So can you talk a little bit about how uh, how they grew tobacco and what um, what was it like for you to be watching the tobacco in the you know 21st century? Yeah, so part of my research that I've done is I've read uh, pretty much every manual about tobacco cultivation that was written before uh, maybe 1800 or so and a few written after. And, um, but before, before they have manuals for tobacco cultivation, then the question that I'm interested in is how did they figure out how to grow it before that? And there's a lot of evidence that um, Europeans relied really heavily on indigenous labor, indigenous knowledge to learn how to grow tobacco. Tobacco, um, it's not, you know, it's not as difficult or as labor intensive as certain other, as sugar, for example, sugar is the kind of the the, you know, the crop that a lot of people are interested in, how does it grow? How does knowledge about it go from place to place? And tobacco is just kind of seen as something that was there. But, um, you know, good tobacco is better than bad tobacco. And so there was some some tutelage that that went on in learning how to how to grow it, but also how to process it, how to dry the leaves out so that you can smoke it or, or snuff it, for example. And there are... Um, when people are writing about these early short-lived colonies, they will often mention that there were, for example, indigenous people working on these plantations. Now, it's not always clear whether that labor is enslaved labor, whether it's coerced in some ways, or whether it's freely given. Probably it ex all of those are, are true in, in various cases. Um, but another thing is that when I was reading these tobacco cultivation manuals, even from, you know, as late as 1800, they will often say, um, they make that connection between indigenous people, right? They will say, there's a one I found written in German and it says, we learned how to grow tobacco from the Indians. So these are, um, you know, these are all, all things that, um, where, where they do actually credit indigenous knowledge. If you read botanical books, they'll talk about we learned this use of tobacco from the Indian women. So there's, it's there. They do credit that kind of knowledge. Oh, it's so interesting that it's the women that they're maybe crediting. Um, yeah, yeah, the women, yeah, it is. Yeah, and this is one particular botanical work that I'm thinking of, but they, yeah. Yeah. Um, so is it, do you, um, how did it go when they tried to grow tobacco in New Netherland? Did, like, did it take off at all or not really? Yeah, so the so this is the question, right? And you know, if you so tobacco does grow, every, you know, not everywhere, but most everywhere. And uh, you know, in a later period, that 
the Connecticut River Valley becomes a tobacco cultivation center. So um, it's not such a wild idea. Um, so one of the things they do, and some of the people that were interested in this, some familiar New Netherland names. So, um, you know, Killian von Rensselaer is interested in growing tobacco, wants to start tobacco plantations. And what he does is he brings um, uh, some people. I haven't, I don't have definitive proof that they know how to grow tobacco, but he brings in farmers from places where they are already growing tobacco in the Netherlands. So that's another facet to the story. There's also tobacco cultivation happening in the Netherlands by this time. And um, they also bring in people, some Virginians wind up in New Netherlands and they grow tobacco there. And um, then of course, there's also some indigenous, there's a few references to indigenous people. So it says um, in the indigenous people who are growing the tobacco. And that could be tobacco that these indigenous people were growing and then, and then trading, or perhaps they were, you know, um, uh, working on some of these plantations, it's not clear, but there's a variety of um, ways that they're trying to seek out this expertise. And they do grow tobacco. Um, the, the New Netherland uh, uh, cheerleader, I guess, Adrian Vanderdock, he says it's better than Virginia tobacco, but I don't know if he's- What a surprise that he thinks it's yeah, better. I know. Than I know. New Netherland is the greatest place in the world to this guy. So we maybe can't trust him, but he says it's better than Virginia tobacco. And that's one of their plans. So, you know, Van Rensselaer says, um, you know, we'll, we'll have, we'll, we'll do better than the Virginians and, and, and people growing tobacco in the Caribbean because they put high, they put a lot of taxes on it in England and France. And so we'll, we'll have a cheaper product. Um, what happens though is by the time they're really getting this started in the 1640s, um, there, there's a, a, a bit of slump in the tobacco market. So the tobacco isn't fetching the really high prices that it was when they were um, you know, growing it in, in these short-lived South American colonies and, and initially in the Caribbean. So they got so in on it a little bit too late in New Netherlands. Yeah, and then there's some other problems that you and, and maybe some in the audience might know about. There's a perpetual problem with trying to get people to um, immigrate to New Netherlands. Um, there are, there are a lot of English people there. There are a few English people there growing tobacco, um, but there, there are problems there. And then, you know, when, when the English capture New Netherland, they don't need a tobacco colony. So all of those plans are really, um, they fall apart definitively by that, by that time. Right. That makes sense. So you've mentioned a few times, you know, the kind of English and Dutch, um, cooperation and you've talked a bit about Spanish and Dutch uh well enmity and cooperation um yeah. so I, what what do you think about um you know I think one of the things that's really important about your work is that you show us that uh the Dutch and New Netherland were never just alone you know out there uh, so can you talk a little bit more about these kind of inter-imperial connections yeah, that's something I'm really interested in, and and I do archival work in um, in the Netherlands, of course, but also in, in England, in France, and in Spain, and partly because I'm interested in what all those empires are are up to. Uh, but I think there are advantages to it. So the first one is that there's a lot of interaction among these empires, some of which I've already referred to, in the Caribbean, especially. Um, you know. Sometimes they're sharing small islands, even if they're not, they can often, you know, they might be able to see a, a rival, a rival's island. The Spanish are also always complaining about what the Dutch and English are up to. So if you really want to know what they're doing, the Spanish archives can be very useful for that. Um, sometimes you have to read it a little critically and, and tone it down a little bit. But, you know, so the Spanish will say the Dutch and the English pirates. And then, you know, the Dutch and the English will say, we traded with them. They don't have good trade connections, so they're willing to buy our stuff. So you have to kind of read between the lines to figure out what was really happened. But there's also a lot of collaboration. So, um, you know, there are French colonists that wind up um, in some of these Dutch colonies in the Guianas and elsewhere. Um, there are Anglo-Dutch uh, collaboration in a lot of these efforts. The other, the other thing that is really important about this is um, reading these sources alongside one another is, is a way to figure out what indigenous, what was going on with indigenous peoples as well. 
Um, so for example, the Spanish will, um, again, complaining about the Dutch in the Guianas, and they say they work really closely with the Carib people. There's this really great image of a Dutch ship and a, and a Carib uh, pirogue, like canoe, alongside one another attacking a Spanish colony. And um, they say, you know, they're, they're, they marry, they marry Carib women and they, and they complain about, they write all these kinds of things, things that you might not necessarily find in the Dutch sources, right? And um, the Dutch and the English are also complaining about, you know, Spanish alliances and enslavement of indigenous people. So really reading these sources together gives you a fuller picture of, of indigenous life, but just of, of what was going on in, in these um, contested regions. Um, so you're, I think, in the Netherlands right now on a Fulbright. Yes. Yeah, so can you tell us what you're you're researching right now? Yeah. And my rented house just happens to have a Rembrandt painting. So yes, I did notice that it was a particularly appropriate. It's very appropriate. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. So I'm here on a, a Fulbright Fellowship and I'm uh, doing some teaching and research at the University of Leiden. And uh, some of this is for a new project I'm working on, which is about Juan or Jan Rodriguez. And he was a free man of African descent who lived on Hispaniola in what is today Haiti, but at the time was claimed by the Spanish. And um, in 1612, he winds up on, on a Dutch ship and he, he's taken to the Hudson Valley where he operates as an intermediary between Dutch traders and indigenous people. So this is before the Dutch are sending colonists to the Hudson Valley. They're not sending settlers there yet. And he shows up in a few Dutch records and they're actually you know, complaining about him because they say he's not working in their best interest. And so um, the project that I'm working on is, it's about him, but it's sort of also about his world. And I'm hoping to um, answer some of the questions I have. So for example, why did the Dutch decide to use him as an intermediary um, instead of using, as they did elsewhere, you know, just a, a, a Dutch person that they would send to live in the colony. You know, are there other people like him? Um, I'm interested in thinking about what kind of interactions he may have had with indigenous people. This is a little bit speculative because obviously we don't really know, but um, he lived there for at least two years and maybe longer. So, you know, what would they have had in common or, or how might they have interacted with one another and, and, you know, being in the Netherlands has really been an interesting way to, to think about these questions. So I was um, on a boat tour <laughs> uh, and um, about, and, and the tour was about Black Amsterdam. And there's been a lot of work done on this. There was, you know, there were museum exhibits about this. And there was this, you know, community um, in the time of Rembrandt uh, and living close to Rembrandt of, of Black people, so a, a pretty sizable community. And so, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is how might the, the presence, those, the presence of those people in the Netherlands have influenced how some of these merchants and traders who may have come into contact with the people of this community thought about Rodriguez. Um, so these are just some things I'm I'm working on it. It's so interesting because we know so little about the period uh, between, let's say, 1609 and 1624, yeah. and even beyond. The records really pick up more in 1638. So it's uh, right. it's fascinating that that you're focusing on 1612, like an era that we really know so little about. Um, yeah. It's also, I mean, again, being, bringing it back to inter imperial uh, inter imperial connections. I mean, yeah, what it's the Spanish guy basically who's uh, right getting the Dutch a foothold in New Netherland, you know, before there's even a West India company. So it's just that those connections are just so, um, so important for how these colonies developed. Um, okay, we're, we got some questions in the chat. So one uh, person would like to know, um, how fast does tobacco grow? And I think we could kind of expand upon that question a bit by saying, you know, um, what's the growing cycle of tobacco and, you know, how, how quickly can you make a profit on tobacco if all is going well, you know? Yeah, great question. So um, it depends quite a bit on where you are and where you're growing it. So for example, you, you can even grow it in Canada, but you would, the, the growing cycle is a bit shorter there, right? In some places in the Americas, you can grow two crops a year because the, because it's tropical. Um, so it varies a bit. Um, the seed, so some things about tobacco cultivation, the seeds are really small. They have been found in archaeological sites too, which is quite cool. There's some, when I was at 
when we were in Williamsburg, um, <laughs> I met up with some of the people who, the archeologists working on Jamestown and, and they found um, tobacco seeds there at Jamestown. So they're very small. Um, in, in later periods, they're often started separately and then the, the, they're planted, but in the earlier periods, they probably didn't do that so much. Um, and um, if you wanna make a stronger, pro there's things you can do to make them have a stronger nicotine content. You can trim the leaves and things like this. Um, they, indigenous people consume it in all kinds of ways and it's really embedded into their um, diplomatic, cultural, all kinds of, of, of practices. And so although smoking, and also snuff for a time takes off as kind of the, the way to really consume tobacco. Indigenous people use it in all kinds of ways, some of which Europeans do experiment with in the early decades. So, um, you know, lighting a bunch of it on fire and inhaling the smoke or making a paste out of it. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of um, really early on and, you know, Europeans write about this as a potential medicinal cure. So you can turn it into a paste and it actually does have some um, antiseptic pro pro sorry, properties. So there's oh, something- so they weren't that. wrong. Yeah, they are, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, we have another question about tobacco. Um, do you know if there was any tobacco planting in the Delaware River slash New Amstel uh, region of New Netherland? Yes. Um, the the questioner is specifically wondering about relations or tensions with Maryland, the neighboring Mar Maryland, and you know how that might have played into to this tobacco cultivation. Yes, there there is absolutely tobacco growing there, and um, there is a a governor there who actually buys up some of that Maryland. They the Mar some of the Maryland planters for a time actually sell it to the Dutch to avoid paying taxes. Um, so the new Amstel, yes, they do grow tobacco there and there's uh, the records do have a lot about, um, 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 sort of tension with indigenous people and, and, a, and, a you know, indigenous people saying, oh, they're growing tobacco and also plans to kind of profit off of what the English are doing <laughs> nearby too. Yeah. That's so interesting that the, the Maryland planters were selling to the Dutch, um, again, that's that that interimperial, uh, you know, competitiveness is so uh, so prevalent even in New Netherland, a place where we don't think of it as much as maybe in the Caribbean. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, we're getting another tobacco question. We are testing your tobacco expertise. Um, how hard is tobacco on the land? I.e., does it require a lot of fertilizer? Does it deplete the land of nutrients? Um, yeah. Yes. Yes, it does deplete the land and it requires a lot of nitrogen. And so if you're growing it really intensively, which indigenous people, you know, don't, they're not growing, you know, they're not growing vast plantations of just tobacco, then it's not a problem. But um, as they learn very quickly in Virginia, it does really quickly exhaust the soil. So they start to grow it. Um, Europeans, when they, when they initially colonize places in the Caribbean. So like St. Kitts, which is the first Caribbean colony of the English and the French, but where they sell a lot of that tobacco on to Dutch, <laughs> to Dutch traders who, who come by, um, they start with tobacco. And that's true of a lot of, of colonies before they turn to sugar, but they realize really quickly that, well, not only is sugar more profitable, but tobacco is, um, yeah, too, too harsh on the soil and that it doesn't really you can't really grow it on a on an on a small island very profitably for very long oh that's interesting so it could have been that the dutch would have uh, even if 1664 had not happened um they might not have been able to keep growing tobacco um we have a question from someone who who says you know they have some ancestors that uh were immigrants to actually dutch brazil uh in the mid 1600s uh, and the person's finding, you know, difficult to find non-academic uh, sources on this subject. But just to expand on this question a little bit, as um, in your experience, uh, what academic, what non-academic sources are there that people could could look at if you have any suggestions for, you know, this kind of broader history of the Dutch and the Atlantic uh, world, you know, in the Caribbean and in the in Guyanas and Netherlands and stuff. Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm thinking about Dutch Brazil, and I'm not 
I'm I'm just trying to think. Did you can you think of anything of on Dutch Brazil, like kind of more popular stuff off the top of your head? Yeah, I don't think there's that much that is popular about Dutch Brazil, but you know, I think the things that are more accessible about Dutch Brazil, personally, maybe I don't know if you you'll agree, but are kind of the the art um the art historical texts because they have a lot of images in them. Um and obviously the Moritz House uh in The Hague is a great place to go uh to to get uh some understanding of of Dutch Brazil and their publications, I think would probably be a good a good uh thing to check out because the Moritz House says so much about about Brazil. So that's yeah. that's what I would say. Um yeah, I'm trying to think about more good popular history. I mean, so the project I'm working on, one of my aspirations is to make it a write a more popular history. So, oh, so uh, Melissa's book could be the answer to yeah, this. Yeah. I mean, as the academic, you kind of have to write your first book. I don't want to say less accessible, but more academic. Yes. <laughs> um, but I think it's a, I think it's a problem because I think it's an arena that a lot of people, I think that's quite interesting and there's a lot going on there and that there should be more, um, you know, popular work. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Russell's book on New Netherland has kind of been um, I, a, a model that we haven't been able to to copy for other places, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. And it's possible that there are some great things out there also that I am not, um, that I'm not thinking of. Yes, it, yes, that's certainly possible. But, um, it's hard to think on one foot sometimes. Um, I guess I would also recommend for people who are in the Netherlands, the exhibitions at the Stadtsarchiv in uh, in Amsterdam. Um, I think those are good places to learn and the archivists may be able to help also with uh, looking at people. And you know, there's, um, you can you can put your, well, any of you who have ancestors who are involved in these things can put your ancestors' names into um, the transcribus records. Uh, and see from the notarial archive, um, you know, if you can find anything about them, you know, that's certainly a possibility that you might be able to find information in the notarial records or in the West India Company. And anyone who wants to know more information about that can can uh, email uh, me at the Netherlands Institute directly, uh, and I can help you with that. Happy to help. Um, well, I think we're out of time. So um, thank you so much, Melissa, for joining us. This was uh, such a great conversation uh, about the way that New Netherland fit into the larger landscape of North America and the Americas more generally. Um, thanks for having me and thanks to all of you for uh, for joining us. Yeah, thank you.